So look, you've heard a fantastic uh, summary of the immunology of asthma from Professor Lloyd in the last uh, 20 minutes. And I wanted to deliberately change tack over the next 15 minutes to really focus on a much more clinical problem that's grounded in the engineering and physical sciences. And it really stems from an early fascination that I had when I came into medicine of how the lungs work. And this is really fundamental to all respiratory diseases, uh, including asthma. And over the next 15 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about the structure and function of the lungs, particularly a very specialized compartment in the lung called, called the small airways. And some of the research that my group have done in the context of interdisciplinary consortia over the last 10 years, and ultimately, at, at, at the end, try to summarize how this research could uh, congregate with the research that you've heard from Claire earlier on, and what we're doing to then address the, the gaps in, in the asthma pathophysiological space. So you saw a cartoon very, very similar to this in Claire's talk. Adult respiratory diseases, and asthma is no exception, are a consequence of lots of factors that take place over a person's life course. And you know, you'll all be familiar uh, with the concept of cardiovascular health, you know, measuring your blood pressure or your cholesterol or watching your diet to make sure that your heart is healthy. But how many of you think about your lung health? And this is critical because we know that respiratory health and the structure and function of your lungs is one of the major determinants of how, how long you live. It's much better than your blood pressure or how well your heart functions. It's also a major determinant of other factors of your health, such as your metabolic health. So really preserving respiratory health is a major uh, mission of all chest physicians like me. And this is particularly important in asthma. And you heard in Claire's talk, the whole range of factors affect respiratory health and lung function in patients with asthma. I see patients here at the end of the asthma spectrum that have severe asthma in my clinical practice, often at the stage where they need highly specialized biologic therapies to modify inflammation in the lung to target their disease and improve their disease. But by that time, it's too late. Everything's happened much earlier on in life. And we know, and you heard this in Claire's talk, that there are multiple genetic influences of adult lung function and respiratory health. We know that Respiratory health is anchored to your health in the womb. So for example, if, you're, if your mother smoked, you're much more likely to develop asthma. If you're born prematurely, even by a couple of weeks, you're much, much more likely to develop asthma. And the development of asthma is intertwined with social justice. So you're much more likely to develop asthma if you come from a deprived inner city area that's close to a major road, for example, where you're exposed to air pollution. And you'll all be familiar with the tragic case of Ellie Kissy Deborah, who died tragically a few years ago. Uh, and the death was linked to exposure to particulate matter and air pollution close to a major road in London. So th this really hits home. So how do we measure respiratory health? Well, we have very old techniques. And on the left hand side, for those of you that are not familiar, is a spirometer. And this is a technique that measures the expiratory flow when you try and force air out of your lungs, just like those lungs that you saw in Claire's talk. So we know that your lung health can be measured with uh, techniques such as spirometry, but these are really hard for patients to do. Spirometry is a difficult thing for patients. It doesn't measure the structure and function of your lungs, but we know that once you come to see a patient, a doctor like me in a severe asthma clinic, if you've got abnormal spirometry and your FEV1, that's the amount of air that you can blow out in a second, is reduced, you're much more likely to have severe asthma. It's one of the cardinal features of severe asthma. And once you start to develop severe asthma, you start to have asthma attacks, you're much more likely to then have further asthma attacks and you're much more likely to then die from your asthma. So one of the cardinal holy grails of uh, respiratory medicine and asthma care is to preserve lung health right the way from the inception of disease in childhood all the way through to adult disease. And we don't do that particularly well. And one of the reasons why we don't do it particularly well is that the tools and techniques that we have to measure the, the airways and lung health are not very good. They're not very sensitive. The technique that I talked to you about earlier on in, in, in the slide just gone, which is spirometry, measures all of the large airways in the main conducting airway tree seen here. That's the first six or seven generations of airways 
But actually, these smaller airways that are less than or equal to two millimetres in diameter, they represent the majority of your airways. And gas moves through these airways when you breathe in by convection and then by molecular diffusion in these very small pockets or bubbles in your lung, which we call the asini, all the way through to the alveoli where gas is exchanged. And everything in asthma happens in this zone. Everything, all of the action is happening in this zone. For everything that we do to study asthma, whether that's bronchoscopy or spirometry or tests to, to look at the structure and function of the lungs, like CT scans, they're all in this zone. So actually, we're not very well equipped to understand the pathogenesis of asthma until we unlock this quiet zone of the lung. And indeed, the small air, airways are a major site of airways obstruction in asthma, and spirometry is not sensitive to their function. This is a critical point. So we need better tools to measure the structure and function of the small airways. So are the small airways diseased in asthma? And yes, they are. You saw lots of beautiful examples of the immunopathology of asthma in Claire's previous slide. But when we take specialized samples just of the very small airways of the lung, which we can do, with a specialist technique through bronchoscopy, which again you saw in Claire's slide, we see that the small airways are very markedly inflamed in asthma. And that's across the spectrum of asthma severity. We see it in mild asthma, so the cells that you heard about in uh, Claire's talk, type two immune cells such as eosinophils and certain types of T cells and mast cells are avidly enriched in the small airways of the lung, both in mild asthma, but also in severe asthma. And this is relative to these larger airways that you saw in my earlier slide. And the small airways are massively different in patients that die from asthma. If you've ever looked down a microscope at somebody that died from asthma, the findings are really striking. These patients have mucus that's blocking all of the small airways. You can see why the air airflow is limited in those patients or was limited before they died. They've usually shed their epithelium, completely shed it into the lumen of the airway. And the airway is markedly remodeled. And there's a loss of elastic fibers that hold these small airways open. One of the big challenges though with pathology uh, and immunopathology in studying the small airways is that asthma as a disease is really patchy. And here's a spatial map of small airways disease using a, a type of imaging tool called a CT scan. And in this patient with severe asthma, small airways disease is all located here in the base of the lung seen yellow on this image. And you can see that it's very patchy and it's very spatially uh, heterogeneous. So if I put a camera down into this patient's lung and I took some biopsies from this lung in this region here, I might actually miss the disease. And if I took a lavage from the lung to, to capture immune cells, which is usually taken from, from the middle lobe of the lung or the lingula on the left hand side, I'd miss all of the disease. So whilst pathology and the detailed information that we get at these very small spatial length scales is vital, it's vital in understanding asthma pathogen pathogenesis, Pathology does not capture the impact of, uh, of disease in asthma on the host and the physiology, which then ultimately leads to symptoms and events in patients like asthma attacks and ultimately asthma death. So we need better tools to determine the pathophysiology of the airways, in particular, the small airways. So I became interested in this problem about a decade ago. Uh, and we realized that we needed a different type of research. I would call this interdisciplinary research to really understand this problem. This is a form of research where multiple specialisms come together to really try and unpick a problem. And in this case, the problem was, how do we measure the small airways? Can we develop a simple tool to measure the small airways for those life course studies that are needed to really understand the pathogenesis of the disease? Can we validate it in clinical populations with people like asthma and then ultimately develop really simple instruments? And what we did to address these questions was over the last 10 years, pull together really teams of interdisciplinary researchers, combining all of these specialisms that you can see on the right hand side this required expertise in imaging, computer modeling, clinical expertise, biostatistical expertise, expertise in the immunology and pathology of the lungs, but also social sciences, and really strong input from patients and healthcare providers. So this is the concept of interdisciplinary working. And I'm gonna talk about this concept in the next few slides as we started to build models of the small airways to understand small airways disease in asthma. 
So the first experience with a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary consortium was this one here. And this is the AirProm consortium. It's quite a mouthful, but AirProm was an ICT, that's an information computing and technology call that was led by the European Commission through the Framework 7 programme. And we bidded for this call three times, actually, and eventually were successful in building the first interdisciplinary consortium to build computer models of the lung to understand the structure and function of small airways, but also models of the lung more broadly across these different scales at the cellular scale, the scale that you heard about in Claire's talk, at the tissue scale to understand tissue biomechanics and the mechanisms of twitchiness of the airways in asthma, and at the patient scale, at the whole organ scale. And I'm going to focus my talk on that scale. This was a truly interdisciplinary consortium bringing together more than 30 partners, patient foundations, industry, and a whole range of specialisms alluded to in the earlier slide. And one of the questions that we set ourselves in this consortium was to really understand the role of the small airways in asthma by developing and validating tools that could be, could be used to measure them. And then ultimately to put those tools out to the community so that they could be then evaluated in life course studies of asthma, which I referred to on the first slide. And this was the right time to do this. Uh, the respiratory community was waking up to the idea that there were lots of tools to measure the disease in the small airways, but nobody really knew whether any of them actually measured anything in the small airways. And we thought that this was an important problem to solve in respiratory medicine because of the need for better tools to identify early disease, uh, to understand the pathogenesis of asthma. And we set ourselves on this task in this consortium. So what, what did we do? We took a really elegant and simple technique to measure lung function that's not spirometry. And we, I chose this technique for several reasons. Firstly, this technique, which is called oscillometry or the forced oscillation technique, can be ju done just during normal breathing. It's not hard for patients. It takes about 15 seconds to do a test. So they breathe and we oscillate their lungs while they're breathing with an acoustic signal, which is a small pressure oscillation. And we measure the response of the respiratory system to that acoustic signal. And the beauty of this technique is that you can do it in anyone. You can do it in children as young as three years of age very easily. And you can do it in 100 year old patients and it's easy to do and it's robust. And it had been long been suggested that this technique may be a useful tool to measure more sensitively than spirometry, the structure and function of the small airways. And we sought to really answer this question. Just to, just to reinforce some of the concepts that I've just talked about, this technique applies acoustic noise to the airways, but it's not noise in the normal human hearing range. It's noise in the infrasound range. So you can, you can analogize this technique to the hearing of a rhino or an elephant because it's in that range of frequency below 20 hertz. You can analogize it to the lowest key on a piano. I don't play the piano, but this is the key that I'm referring to. And this key is barely audible to the human ear. So in this technique, we oscillate the airways with frequencies between about five and 35 hertz, and we measure the response of the system. And we wanted to show that this was a sensitive tool to measure the small airways. So how did we go about doing that? So we started by building a, a computer model of the lung. And on the left-hand side, you can see a, a CT scan from a patient's lung. You can see the main airways. This is the patient lying down. This is their back. This is their front, this is their right lung, this is their left, left lung, and this is the heart. And you can see that it's quite hard to see the airways. But using specialist uh, computer techniques, we were able to pull out the airways from this lung, and you can see that here. And we then decided to build a complete airway tree from these patients from their CT scan. And we used computational approaches to do that, and we filled the volume of the lung using a branching algorithm with a complete conducting airway tree. This is now all of the airways in your lung, barring the asinine. This is 50 to 100,000 branches of airways, depending upon the size of the patient. So we hypothesized that we could use these patient-based models. And on the right-hand side, you can see several of these models from patients with asthma. And they all look very different. This highlights how different your lungs actually are in terms of their structure. We hypothesized that we could use these models to actually act as templates to simulate the structure and function of the small airways and to validate 
important tests for respiratory medicine, such as the forced oscillation technique, which you heard about on the earlier slide, uh, as a way of validating uh, the, the, the function of the test. So the first study that we did, and I'm going to talk you through this slide from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, was that we built these models of the lung in patients with asthma, and then we built physics-based models to simulate the acoustic flow of these oscillating uh, waveforms in the airway, simulating the forced oscillation technique. So I really understand whether this technique measured the small airways. And the beauty of these technique, th this technique and these uh, models is that you can constrict any one of these airways to any degree that you want at any depth and understand what if, you know, what happens if I constrict a certain generation of airway to a certain degree with a certain amount of heterogeneity, what's the impact on the forced oscillation technique? And here in this very elegant study, it was conducted by Brody Foy, who was doing his PhD at that time, okay, supervised by myself. We identified very nicely that in the small airways, which are the first six strata orders of airways in the lung, these airways are very, very sensitive. When you constrict these airways, we can identify an abnormality in this forced oscillation uh, technique measurement that is indicative of small airways disease. And we do not see that when we constrict the larger airways. So using engineering and physical sciences research approaches, we built a model of the lung. We use that model to identify that this technique to measure oscillatory airflow in the lung and the resistance and impedance to that airflow was indeed both sensitive and specific to small airways disease in the lung. We went on to show that when we constrict these airways, we can predict important changes in asthma patient related outcomes, suggesting that the small airways were important determinants of patient outcome. We then went on to conduct a multinational study looking at the clinical relevance of this test in respiratory medicine. This was in a thousand patients across 29 centers and nine countries. We sought to identify what the best test was to measure small airways disease in this multinational consortium called Atlantis. And we were really intrigued and surprised uh, by the fact that that simple technique, this oscillometry technique seen here, was the best tool to measure small airways disease in the lung, and that it was an independent predictor of asthma attacks in patients with asthma, providing an important clinical validation for this engineering and physical sciences approach. We constructed a questionnaire to validate this measurement that could be deployed in clinical populations of small airways disease as a tool. And so what did we achieve over this 10 years of research through three interdisciplinary consortia? We built a physics-based model of the lung. We used that model to determine that a simple test could be used to measure the structure and function of small airways. And we determined its clinical significance in asthma. And these tools are now available for life course studies. And we built a simple questionnaire using that to deploy in those studies. And where are we going next? We very much hope through this new consortium that I co-lead through the Engineering and Physical Sciences Council, that we'll be able to integrate the information at these very small length scales that Claire presented on with this organ level physiology that I've talked about today to build better patient-based computational models of the lung to understand asthma, pathophysiology and pathogenesis. Thank you.